want to look at a scripture here real quick out of 1 Timothy 6.20. And, and I'll read this out of the King James Version. It's uh, the reading that fits the context the best today. 1 Timothy 6.20. Paul says, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is science falsely so called. He said, Paul is saying there are going to come peddlers of that which is falsely called science. And you need to watch out for them. You need to stand guard against them. He's saying you need to defend what they're peddling. Defend against it. And it's very important that we have a basic ability to defend our faith. Very important that we do that. Uh, why is it important that we answer the skeptics when they, when they supposedly present evidence that supports their worldview, why is it so important? Because it matters what people think, doesn't it? Remember on the day of Pentecost, the, the Spirit is poured out on the believers, and what happens, all of the listeners, they say, we hear these people speaking in their own language. Are they drunk? Are they drunk? And, Paul, and Peter stands up and gives an answer. He stands up and gives an answer. He has something to say to it, because... If, if the crowd had thought they were drunk, they would have no, had no time for Jesus. And so he answers. He says, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. What did, what did Peter do? He did the same type of thing we're doing today. He gave an answer. And so that's what we're talking about. The ability to give an answer to the attacks against faith. That's very important. And our key idea here comes from Peter. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15, the apostle wrote, But set apart the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense for the hope that's within you. Always be ready to give a defense. Now that uh, you may have seen on the sign when you came in, it said, Defending your faith, dash apologetics. And that doesn't mean we're apologizing uh, for anything. What that means, apologetics, is it's the Greek word translated defense right here. If you read it in the Greek, Peter says, always be prepared to give an apologetic for the faith you have. It means defense or answer. Always be ready to answer. Now, I remember when I, I used to read this passage from Peter, I would think, hey, you know, someone comes up to me and says, hey, you've got a lot of joy for being a, you know, you got a lot of joy in your life, a lot of hope. Tell me about it. I always thought that's what Peter was referencing here, but I think there's a lot more that could be to that. Because it's not just the interested skeptic that we have to answer. It's the antagonistic skeptic. I tried to share, I remember in the grocery store back in Valley City here a couple years ago, I tried to share Christ with a guy, and he started hitting me. You know, if not hitting me, but pummeling me with his response. You know, there's all this bad stuff happens, and what? how can you say that God loves people? Blah, blah, blah. goes on and on. I needed to be prepared right there to give an answer, to defend the faith I have. And so Peter says, always be ready to give an answer, a defense, a defense for the hope that's in you. Always be prepared for that. So, what I want to do today is I want to try to delve into the heart of the skeptic. What is it that drives the skeptic? It really matters if the evidence, it, it, it matters where the evidence directs us. A skeptic pretends, at least, or su suggests that the evidence does not ever point to God. And uh, I want to I delve into the heart of skeptic here just a little bit and find out what motivates them. And I think the focus we want to say is, what is it that the skeptic does with what he finds? When they do the science, what do they do with their science? What do they do with their evidence? Okay. I was gonna, I'm trying not to make this too much of a lecture, but hell, if I get boring, just help me out and raise your hand and ask a question, okay? <laughs> but, but, yeah. Okay, first thing that's so important to know is that behind every scientist, there's a worldview, okay? Behind every single scientist, there is a worldview. It's a way that they view reality. Now, ours is a Christian worldview. It's called the, sometimes called the Judeo-Christian worldview. It's the way we view reality. It's the, uh, 
It's the foundation on which we view reality and more, uh, um, uh, morality and so on. But for many, in science and in education, the worldview is something we call naturalism. Naturalism is the idea that, that there are natural explanations for everything in existence. And this is what drives the science of many scientists. It's naturalism. And what we're going to find today is that if it doesn't fit into their worldview, they have no interest in it. Okay? Now listen to this quote. You'll find it on the sheet there for those of you who are able to grab one. This is from a Harvard professor, Richard Lewontin. Uh, he's uh, retired, perhaps even deceased at this point. But this is what he wrote a number of years ago. He said, it is not that the methods and institutions of science compel us to expect, accept natural explanations for our world. But on the contrary, he says, we are forced by our a priori or our prior adherence to net material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set, excuse me, a set of concepts to produce material explanations. Let me just explain that real quick. He says, when he says we have an a priori adherence, he says, before we even step into the lab, we are committed to finding natural causes. That's exactly what he's saying. We are committed to finding material causes for everything we see. And so what he's telling us there, he is saying, even if the evidence points to a divine creator, we go into the lab committed to finding natural causes for it. That's what the scientist says. That's what the professor does. He says, no matter how counterintuitive and no matter how mystifying, he says, materialism is absolute. Why? He says, because we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now that is a major confession, isn't it? He's saying, we go into the lab, we go into the classroom, and he says, we are committed to naturalism, not because the evidence points to it, but because we cannot allow God a foot in the door. Now, my question would be this. Why is he so afraid of God? That's a big, that's an that's a important question. Why are these people so afraid of God? Why are they so fearful that God might be the source behind it all? You may have heard of this gentleman. Friedrich Nietzsche, he's a 19th century German philosopher and an atheist. He's the one that popularized the phrase, God is dead. Maybe last summer or whatever, you saw the God's not dead. That's a, about a 120 year late answer to Friedrich, Friedrich Nietzsche. <laughs> but he popularized that. And this is what Friedrich Nietzsche said. He said, it, it is our preference that decides against Christianity, not arguments. It's our preference. So what are they demonstrating? First, they're demonstrating there's a worldview that guides them. So when you hear a scientist talk, when you hear a professor teach, understand there's a worldview that they're teaching and, and studying their science out of. And again, why are they so afraid of the divine foot? Why are they so afraid that God might be the answer? Uh, one man, uh, Richard Dawkins, once suggested that Christianity is a fairy story for those afraid of the dark. Richard Dawkins said that. He said, Christianity is a fairy story for those afraid of the dark. And uh, Oxford professor John Lennox said, well, atheism, I believe, is a fairy story for those afraid of the light. <laughs> <laughs> and you hear that. You say, now there's something to that. Why are they afraid of the divine foot? Because they're afraid of the light. In fact, that's what Jesus said. Or excuse me, John the Apostle in the opening of his epistle. Ah, forgive me, it was Jesus. John 3, 19. This is the condemnation or the verdict, as other translations read. He said, this is the verdict, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. They didn't want them to be brought out into the light. So why does it matter to these people? Because there are behavioral implications if God is on the throne. If God is behind the universe, it matters how we live. And so they have a worldview that they, that they enter the picture or they, they carry with them into the science lab. <clears throat> when God enters the picture, again, behavioral implications. Uh, how many in high school read the book Brave New World? 
Some of you maybe did. I, I know it was, uh, we had a couple uh, students in our class assigned that, I remember. Uh, the author of that, Aldous Huxley, said, I do not want this world to have meaning. He said, because it frees me to do and pursue whatever I please. And so this is the heart behind these people. We can't allow a divine foot in the door. We will find any mechanism of examining reality that will keep God out of the picture. And that's how they enter the examination. Okay, uh, I want to look at uh, four ways that I believe that science in our time mishandles revelation. Remember when the star came over, uh, the, the wise men followed the star from the east, they come to Bethlehem, and remember King Herod, he, uh, they, they, they report to Herod what they find or, or what they've been following. And what does Herod do? He, he calls the, the, the Jew, Jewish leaders. He says, tell me, where's the Messiah going to be born? And they say, Bethlehem. And so he, he makes plans to kill the baby, doesn't he? Now, listen, think about this. The revelation is right there for Herod to pursue to the source of truth. He, by his statement, he's confessing that he at least grudgingly believes the revelation. Otherwise, he would not have killed all those babies. But revelation comes his way. And what does he do with it? He tries to kill it. And that, this is what we're going to see scientists do in our time. The revelation is there. But just like Herod, they try to destroy it. They try to make it irrelevant. Uh, so let's look at another scripture out of a uh, real familiar one out of Romans chapter 1. I, I, I believe we are in Romans 1 territory right now. This is a judgment that Romans 1 is a judgment that Paul speaks of that's going to come on the land upon a people. I think we're right in the middle of that. And uh, so let's, let's read this uh, Romans 1 verse 18 and through 26. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. There's the first thought. They suppress the truth. We just heard uh, Richard Luant and he said we can't allow a divine foot in the door. We're going to suppress anything that points to a creator. Paul said that. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Why? Because what may be known of God is manifest to them. Second point, Paul says it's obvious to them. It's obvious. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that men are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. Third key point, professing to be wise, they became fools. We're going to find that today that the wisest, smartest people among us, when we really look at what they're suggesting, we're going to find that the, those professing to be wise have become fools because of their desire to keep God out of, the, out of the picture. And finally, therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of the heart to dishonor the body among one another. They exchanged the truth of God for lie. Number four, he thought they worshiped and served the, create, the creature. They worshiped and served the creature. That's, a, that's another thing we're gonna, we find when we look at our times. People are serving the creature. Number, and the fifth one, fifth key thought here, this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For their, even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. The first thing we pointed out there was that men suppress the truth, is what Paul says. Atheist, philosopher, writer, and so on, Bertrand Russell, he was once asked, what happens if you, after you die, you find out that God really did exist? And he said, I would tell God, you didn't give me enough evidence. Now, the Bible challenges that idea. The Bible suggests it is men who suppress the truth. That it's not a lack of evidence, but it's a suppression of it. Okay, so let's, let's look at four thoughts here. Uh, four areas that point clearly to a divine creator. And I want to look at how does the world, how do uh, scientists, naturalists, professor, professors, how do they respond to this stuff? 
The first is in the area of the Big Bang. Now, when I was in high school, I thought the Big Bang and the devil were right next to each other on the evil list. Okay? There's nothing worse than the devil, nothing worse than the theory of the idea of the Big Bang. Uh, now, prior to 1900, pretty much every scientist believed the universe was eternal, that it had always been here. And in the in early 1900s, Einstein developed his uh, theory of relativity, and it predicted that the universe actually had a beginning point. Now, he didn't like this, so he cooked the books. He, he added something into his equation that no matter what you did, it always led to an eternal universe. It's called the co cosmological constant. Well, as time went on, it became clear that the universe did indeed have a beginning. Uh, you've heard of he Hubble Telescope. Uh, that, that was, the namesake of that was Edwin Hubble. In 1929, he, he found proof of a beginning point to the universe. And scientists call this, big, this beginning point the Big Bang. That, that, now, that's all the Big Bang is. And we believe in the Big Bang, don't we? I, had, I saw a t-shirt once that said, I believe in the Big Bang. God spoke and bang, it happened. Okay? <laughs> that, that's, that, that's, the Big Bang is really just a, a, an idea, to, a word to explain the beginning point of the universe. And, and Genesis 1.1 Genesis talks about that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so... The idea of the Big Bang, it, it's a, it actually did a lot of help to the idea uh, or to the defense of the faith because it proved there was a beginning point. Now, where there's a divergence is when you look for a cause behind the Big Bang. That's the divergence. When I was in high school, this is how they taught me. They said, the teacher said, at the very beginning, there was a little tiny dot smaller than a period and all of the matter of the universe was squeezed into that little tiny dot, and then there was a big bang happened, and poof, and here we are today. Okay? What they're trying to do is they're trying to make the beginning, the, the, their starting point small enough that it was a smaller step from nothing to something. But, but the divergence happens when you look for a cause. As Christians, we see God as the cause behind the beginning of the universe. And science has proven there's a beginning to the universe. Now, the difference, again, is when you look for a cause behind it. What were the implications of the discovery that the universe had a beginning point? Well, number one, it proved what Hebrews 11.3 says, that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Because before the beginning, there was nothing. And science knows that. And so they are left to find the mechanism that keeps God out of the picture. And so you have a big, high-powered high scientist like Stephen Hawking. If you watch that movie, God's Not Dead, they quoted Stephen Hawking, who said, because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself out of nothing. Now, he's a powerful scientist in that regard, but think about that. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself out of nothing. Now, let's just stop there. Anybody see any problems with that statement? <laughs> Raise your hand. I want to hear, what, what's a problem you see with that statement? Gravity implies mass. Yes. Okay. There's a lot of discussion. Is gravity even a thing? A law is, all a law of science is, is it's something that describes something that always happens. Okay, so that's really what a law is. It describes what always happens. It describes physical realities. But there's, if there's no physical realities, what is, what's the law going to describe? So it is implying physical mass. It's implying also creative power to a law, which all that a law is is something that describes something. Okay, do you have any, see any other problems, maybe with the logic of this statement? Because there is, yes? If there is a law of gravity, there has to be a law giver. Okay, that's a good point too. That's a good point. How can you have a law without a lawgiver? Excellent, excellent. Any other thoughts on this? Yes? If there was always uh, gravity making out the universe, then the universe would always be falling. Okay, okay, good thought, good thought. Yes? Stating that because there is gravity, where does gravity come from? It states that gravity can start the beginning of the universe, but it doesn't answer the question of what was the beginning of gravity. Yes. Think about this, also in line with that. 
He says, because there is something, the law of gravity, because there is something, the universe will create itself out of nothing. <laughs> yeah. Circular reason. Because there's something, the universe will create itself out of nothing. Now, wait a second. That doesn't, that doesn't logically. I, I, I heard uh, this John Lennox say one time that if, if a person with a basic degree in philosophy had read this book, it never would have gone to press uh, because the logic is so flawed. Uh, because there is something, the universe will create itself out of nothing. But there's another problem with that, and it is this, that um, normally to create something, you first must exist, right? I mean, how many of you created things before you existed? Nobody. And usually that's a problem, but not in his world. In his world, it's okay. You can create things before you exist. And that's what the universe did to him. It created itself before it existed. Logical flaws all through it. But this is the world's top scientist. He held the same chair that Isaac Newton held at Cambridge. Top science chair in the world. And uh, big problems with the logic there. But you see what he's done. He has given creative power to the creature. Remember Paul said that? He said they will worship and serve the creature. Paul, this, this great scientist, he's saying the creature has creative power to create itself. And so now what do they do? Well, they are the apologists of the creature. <laughs> they defend the idea that the creature is the creator. And now they worship and they serve their, the creature instead of the creator. Here's what it comes down to. No matter how you divide up the physical world, you arrive at a state of affairs that cannot explain its own existence. And so logically, you have to look for something outside of nature to explain nature. And by definition, something outside of nature would be supernatural, right? And so the, really the only logical deduction is to say there's something supernatural behind the formation of the universe. Because at the beginning is when the natural world started. And so let's look at another. Fine tuning. Fine tuning. Uh, over the past couple decades, physicists have discovered that the universe has been almost pre programmed to function in such a way to allow life to happen. Now, uh, imagine, if you would, with me, that uh, you come into the room and there is a, uh, something that looks like a, a mixer board, a sound board up here. It's got, let's say, 30 channels on it with sliders. Okay, you're familiar with those. You see a little picture in the diagram there if you have a paper. And every one of those, one, every one of those sliders is marked with a different, a different uh, uh, slider that controls the setting of the universe, <clears throat> okay? So one of them says the gravitational force, another one says the electronic, electromagnetic force, and every one of them is, uh, is labeled with a, a, a sticker that tells you what universe setting it controls. What science has found, and again, science is a friend of the Bible, okay? What science has found is that there is extreme precision in the pre-settings of, of the universe. To the point that at some, uh, on some of the examples, if you move it a, a minute point, the universe would not be able to work. It would not be able to exist. And so the problem, what, the, what this points out is, if God's not the source behind the universe, the naturalist has to say, it just happened. But chance, <laughs> logic tells us it's not possible. Because all of these settings were preset in such a way that if you move them just a little bit, if, by, their, by their logic, if chance would not have happened just right, we wouldn't even be here. And, and on your paper, you have one example of the gravitational force. And, and the d description is this, if you had a ruler, the length, that, the length of the known universe, and you move the strong gravitational force the amount of one inch, the universe doesn't function, it would not allow life-permitting planets to exist. Extreme precision in the tuning of the universe that allows it to, that, that permits life to exist. And so again, what do they do by, with this? What do they do with this? Well, they have to find again a mechanism to avoid God. And so uh, one guy says, well, it's necessity. 
And you say, well, what do you mean necessity? He says, well, we're here, aren't we? Okay, what's your point? He said, well, if we're here, then it must have happened. And, and again, <laughs> that's their logic. It's, again, it's circular reasoning. And uh, they're saying, we're here, so it must have happened like that. Well, no, it didn't have to happen like that unless your only worldview you allow in is a natural one. Okay? Uh, so then they, they say, well, that doesn't work. Let's come up with something else. So then another guy comes up with a multiverse theory. He says, maybe there are an, an infinite number of universes around somewhere. We don't have any evidence for any of them, they'll confess. And we can't prove it, and you can't ever go to another universe, but... Let's just assume that there's an infinite number of universes so that every chance setting happened. And boom, here we are. <laughs> that's, that's their answer. That's the answer. Remember what Paul said, professing to, become wise, to be wise, they've become fools. Become fools. A multiverse? They, they, they say, that this is their logic, that there's an infinite number of universes and every possible universe exists. And ours is the one that works, and so we're here. <laughs>